Every now and then, an idea takes form that changes everything. It revolutionizes the way we see and understand the world around us. I believe that just such an idea took form in the medieval Islamic world. It's the idea that everything from the stars above to the workings of our own bodies is not arbitrary or whimsical, but subject to certain systematic rules. And what's more, that we humans can work out what those rules might be. And then we can refine and test our theories through observation and experiment. In other words, it's the idea we now call the scientific method. For me, the story of the scientific renaissance that took place in the medieval Islamic world is a personal one. This is my cousin Semir's house in the Iranian capital Tehran. I haven't seen some of the relatives on my father's side of the family in over 30 years. This is my not so tall but very beautiful auntie Anissa. The Al Khalili family is originally from the city of Nejef in Iraq, south of Baghdad. In fact, I grew up in Iraq. But when Saddam Hussein came to power, the family split. Many of the Al Khalilis fled here to Iran. As my mother's English, I came to Britain with my parents. There, I pursued my passion for science and I'm now a professor of physics at the University of Surrey. But now I find that my own scientific work and my Arabic and Islamic heritage are intertwined. On my journey through the Middle East, I discovered that an astonishing leap in scientific knowledge took place here a thousand years ago under a powerful and flourishing Islamic empire. Wealthy, powerful, successful cultures will produce enormous advances in understanding and in technique. And that's just what we find in Islam, in Baghdad, under a series of successful, powerful, wealthy and self-confident Islamic regimes. Over a thousand years ago, the Islamic empire was the largest in the world. It governed an estimated 60 million people. That was over 30% of the world's population. I found an archeological fragment of this glorious past in a suburb of Tehran, not far from my cousin's house. These ancient walls, tucked behind a back street on the outskirts of southern Tehran, are literally all that remain of the ancient city of Ray, the city that the great Persian geographer Al Muqaddasi described as one of the glories of Islam. Of course, Ray was just one of a number of cities that flourished under early Islamic rule. From Baghdad, its capital, the empire spread across thousands of miles from North Africa through to Central Asia. Cities like Al Askar, Basra, Merv, Gurganj, Bukhara, each powerful and thriving cities. Each would have been rich in trade, alive with culture. Each would have had its own libraries, its own academies. These were powerhouses of the new science. This really was a golden age. Think of that span of land. This is larger than any empire human civilization had ever known. Within that span of land, you can plug in the Roman Empire, and it will fill just maybe, what, one third of it, one half of it, or something like that. Reminders of this great Islamic empire are everywhere in the Arab world today. This football match in the Syrian capital, Damascus, is being played at the Abbasid Stadium. That's the name of the family who ruled the Islamic Empire from
from 750 to 1258 AD. <laughs> this large territory allowed them to raise enormous tax revenues to fund a search for knowledge and scholarship, which became known as the translation movement. They sent scholars around the known world to gather up great books and have them translated into Arabic. It's a legacy that's still alive in the minds of most modern Arabs. <laughs> For medieval Islamic leaders, scientific knowledge was crucial to successfully running a vast empire. They did have a big and sophisticated governmental administration, and obviously that needed knowledge. If you wanted to be an administrator and you had to assess taxes, you needed to know about mathematics. It also wants to be able to build monumental buildings that requires the knowledge of architecture and again mathematical skills to construct fine buildings safely. Medicine just to keep the elite happy and healthy. And those are the areas of knowledge which are first translated from other languages into Arabic. The legacy of the medieval Islamic empire is scattered across a vast region. There's architectural masterpieces like the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, the Jama Mosque in Isfahan, and Al Azhar University Mosque in Cairo. And then there are many ruins that still hint at past glories, like this, a crumbling 8th century palace deep in the Syrian desert. And this, a huge Muslim palace called Medina to Zahra, currently being excavated in southern Spain. These are the impressive ruins of Medina to Zahra, the fantastic palace city built outside Cordoba in the 9th century by Abdurrahman III, who was the greatest of all the Andalusian caliphs. At the time that it was ruined, Cordoba was in fact the largest and most important city in Europe. Arrival to Baghdad in the east for a center for Islamic scholarship and science. And as I traveled, I saw how science, especially numerical record keeping and measurement, was crucial to dealing with the challenges of running a vast empire. This is the mighty River Nile, as it flows through the Egyptian capital, Cairo. Since antiquity, its unpredictable floods have determined the fate of Egypt's people, bringing years of lean and plenty. By the 8th century, Cairo was part of the Islamic Empire, and the new rulers took the first step to understanding this mighty river in a scientific way. They built a device to measure it. Dr. Nader al Bizri of the Institute of Ismaili Studies is showing me the Nihilometer. It's basically a huge colonnade that was built in a chamber connected by tunnels to the river. As the water rose or fell, its height could be read from the central column. The central colonnade here is ultimately a measuring uh, instrument. It is very precise, it's almost one inch between a marking and another. Presumably they need to know seasonal variations in the height. And to demark, uh, try to have some sort of record so that they could measure against certain years where a year was known for uh, a, a high level yes. of flood versus another year known for its drought. Then they might perhaps take some precautions. Yes. The data collected from the Nihilometer did have one practical use. By creating an objective record of the river's behavior, it allowed the rulers of the time 
to calculate how much tax to levy on Egypt's farmers. But whatever its uses, what I love about the Nilometer is how it shows that to understand the world, you have to build devices to measure it. If you think very hard, it's never obvious that measurement can make sense of the world around us. The world appears, as a Western philosopher once put it, like a buzzing, blooming confusion. And the idea that we as a group have tools which are reliable, which have sufficient integrity, which have an intellectual grip that can make sense of the basic phenomena we see around us, that's an astonishing idea. And one medieval Islamic ruler made measurement a personal obsession, giving it a scale and ambition that was truly unprecedented. His name was El Ma'mun, and he became the caliph or ruler of the Islamic Empire in 813 AD. El Ma'mun lived in a culture without portraiture, so all we have are later impressions of what he might have looked like. El Ma'mun funded a range of scientific research, but one particular project was a personal favorite of his. And given that he ruled over such a large territory, it's hardly surprising what it was, map making. In the second decade of the ninth century AD, El Ma'mun commissioned a new map of the world. And his scientists did a pretty impressive job. It was a vast improvement on all maps that had come before. What we see here is that they've really got the, the Mediterranean, uh, its shape and how it links in with the Black Sea, uh, the Middle East, even the whole of Asia, as far as China and Japan. Uh, they've even got the, the Indian Ocean and the east coast of Africa. It all looks pretty impressive for, for the known world at the time. Of course, what Al Ma'mun ultimately wanted to know was how much of the Earth as a whole did he possess? And this begged the question, just how big is the Earth? It's a sign of amazing ambition that groups of scholars and craftsmen together can, as it were, capture the world. Where does that ambition and that confidence come from? Part of it comes from uh, religious faith because the world was made by someone a bit like us, but much smarter. If we're smart enough, the thought was, we could probably make sense of a bit of what he did. And that's very clear as a motivation in a lot of Islamic, as in a lot of Christian science. And more specifically, the practice of Islam demanded that its followers have a very clear idea of the size and shape of the world. Now this is crucial information for Muslims because wherever they are in the world, they need to know the direction to Mecca for their prayer. This is known as Al Qibla. Now, over such a large territory, finding the direction to Mecca is not a trivial problem. This problem was wonderfully illustrated when a mosque was built recently in Washington, D.C. Some worshippers were confused because the direction they were told to face when praying was slightly north and not southeast as they expected. After all, Mecca is southeast of Washington, and on a flat map, it does appear to lie in that direction. But on a curved sphere, the shortest distance between any two points follows what's called a great circle. So for example, this great circle line between Washington and Mecca is quite different to what you might expect. So the direction to Mecca from Washington actually points slightly northeast rather than southeast. Of course, this is complicated stuff, but the key point for Islamic scholars is that knowing the direction to Mecca requires a knowledge of how steeply the earth curves. <laughs> 